thank you for coming. We got a really good turnout here tonight, and we've had some conversations in the past about why don't we have a meeting on the CCC camps, and uh, we just talked about it. Well, finally, Sandy and Ruth here have done something about it and put together uh, this program, which I think you're really, really going to enjoy. Uh, when we first came to uh, Fabius, we met Ray Benson, and up here is one of a book belonging to Ray Benson, which has the years in there that he was affiliated with the CCC Kings. And at the time, I think we met him, he was working at Highland Forest, was already a legend, and is a very interesting person. Speaking of interesting people, uh, we announced this in the usual way. I send around emails to all the members for whom I have email addresses, and then we've got about 20 people we don't have addresses for, so I mail you something through the post office. And while I'm doing this, I see Jerry Antill's name. And I think, yeah, I think I'll send him one. He might be interested in this. And then we also send things out by way of Fabius News. So that goes to even more people. And I think that may be where he got his also. And what he did is to write a, in, in my announcement, as many of you know, in my announcement I said, some of you may have stories about the CCC camp. And Jerry Antill wrote back a very interesting little story about his family association with the CCC camp. And he also has something very nice to say about one of you out there. Okay. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, first it was in 1929, my father, Big Mike, was vice president of Hostess Baking in New Jersey. And then he has a friend, Albert and Florence Durkee, who at the time had a small bake shop in Homer. They talked, about they talked about electricity soon to be available in business there. Think of that, electricity. And then Route 11 was built in 1926. Homer is going to get busy. Farmers were growing tobacco and people were making cigar boxes as a profession. Well, what happened? They really thought it would be nice if they could buy a big, what they call, Peterson oven. They could convert the farmers into growing wheat and might become a major bakery. The Peterson oven was almost a half a block long, if you can imagine that. It took nearly three weeks to preheat. <laughs> Think of that, ladies. <laughs> well. These guys didn't have that kind of money, and so they shook hands and they said, maybe when the time comes, if we get the money, maybe we can do something like this. In 1930, Big Mike drove to Homer and handed Albert Durkee a contract he got with the U.S. government to serve FDR's newly created CCC camps in central New York with bread, cakes, and pies. The camps were all over. Listen to this, Tully Lake. There were 12,000 men working in Tully Lake, it says here. Whoa. Uh, Durkee started producing 80,000 loaves of bread a day in 1931. 80,000 loaves of bread. After Albert's death in 1949, Big Mike sold his interests in the mid-1950s, and he created the Duncan Hines baking brand there. Hmm. Here's the personal part. But did you know, a now famous chap, Dan Driscoll's father from Canada, mm -hmm. Fence spills. <laughs> I worked in a CC camp, was part of a team that built
steps and wooded pathways and many outdoor fireplaces and a large pavilion and then the county park called Delphi Falls. And Mr. Driscoll's son, Dan, became Coach Driscoll, my first ever basketball coach at Fabius Central School. And along with Johnny Cook, who scored once 39 points in one game, it says here, Marty Bays and others I look up to, Coach Driscoll as a lifelong big brother and family figure. How about that? Nice. Huh? The team today, we have Ruth Hoteling over here, working the computer right now. Later, be imparting wisdom, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> and we have Sandy Begmonter. Are you going to talk about July and where it's going to be? Our program for July? Yes, let's talk about the July meeting. Uh, many of you remember uh, coming to uh, Steve Jones's meeting. Steve is a retired financial advisor. Steve is a retired high school musician, music teacher. But Steve is an excellent, as you heard last year, baritone singer and he just gets into some of these things and just really does a terrific job and what steve wants to do in july and the meeting is going to be at the church because we're going to be using the piano over there so it's going to be at the church it'll be uh is it the first monday yes. with fourth of july no, it is the first monday in july seven o'clock in the church what uh, we're going to do, he's going to do some uh, show business, things from plays and so forth. And I know some of you probably like that. When I bought my latest car, I got Sirius Radio and I've been listening to show tunes forever. I get all excited. Uh, he's going to take some of the songs, many of which you know, you'll remember from some of the uh, show business and talk about some of the background and the factors involving and putting on the plays and so forth and people involved. He's also going to take a look at maybe a kind of a difficult subject, but maybe an important one, and that is racial differences and racial integration in Broadway show business. So yeah, it's going to be good. I plan to make it first Monday in July over at the church at 7 p.m. on Monday. And are you ladies ready to go? She's ready. Uh, if some of you want to see this, I read from, I'll leave it up. Okay, welcome everybody. It's so nice to see you all here. Last year, Irene Kutcher suggested that we do a program on the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. It involved using people all across the United States for many benefits. I want to thank Irene for the idea and Ruth Hotelling for her help and resources. Most of today's program is based on the book, The, the Tree Army, a pictorial History of the Civilian Conservation Corps, 1933 to 1942. It was compiled by Stan Cohen and copyrighted in 1980. The Civilian Conservation Corps was one of the best New Deal programs created under the leadership of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. When FDR came into office in 1933, his dream was to revitalize the economy and end the Depression. The CCC was established in March 1933 to provide employment for some of the millions of youths who could not find jobs during the Depression years. Also, at the same time, America's abundant natural resources were being ravaged by man and nature. Millions of acres of farmland were being eroded away, threatened by fire, or by indiscriminate timber harvesting. The purpose of the CCC was for forest protection and improvements. It also provided 
the development of parks, disaster relief, soil erosion control, wildlife protection, historical restoration, and many other services that benefited America for years. The CCC employed three million young men who had no jobs. It gave them hope, it helped them to be self-supporting, it let them build self-esteem, it taught them how to be men. Many learned to read and write, obtained diplomas, or learned a trade. Many went on to serve the U.S. in World War II. The CCC established more than 4,000 camps in the current 50 states, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, mostly on national forest land. The organization was first called Emergency Conservation Work, but Roosevelt used the term Civilian Conservation Corps in his congressional speech, which was more popular. Okay. Uh, the enlistment period was for six months with the option for re-enlistment for another six months up to a maximum of two years. The enrollee was paid $30 a month. He was allowed to keep $5 while the remaining $25 was sent to his family. The government provided him with room and board, clothing, and tools. The enrollee was to work a 40-hour work week and obey camp rules. The enrollees were sent to existing army bases for days of exercise before, before going to assigned camps. And here you see them doing their exercises to get into shape. Yes. It's like a big wave. Several camps for women had been established in New Hampshire and New York, but the CCC was mainly a man's organization. On July 17, 1933, President Roosevelt made a radio address to the CCC. You want to see those guys? No. Okay, the men of the Civilian Conservation Corps. I think of you as a visible token the encouragement to the whole country. You nearly 300,000 strong are evident that the nation is still strong enough and broad enough to look after its citizens. You are evidence that we are seeking to get away as fast as we can, possibly, can from soup kitchens and free rations. Because the government is paying you wages and maintaining you for actual work to work, which is needed now for the future and will bring a definite financial return to the people of the nation. Through you, the nation will graduate a fine group of strong young men, clean living, trained to be self-disciplined, and above all, willing and proud to work for the joy of working. Too much in recent years, large numbers of our population have sought our success as an opportunity to gain money with the least possible work. It is time for each and every one of us to cast away self-destroying, nation-destroying efforts to get something for nothing and to appreciate that satisfying reward and safe reward come only through honest work. That must be the new spirit of America's future. You are the vanguard of that new spirit. And maybe we need that today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, next picture. Okay, and this shows where a lot of the camps were in 1938 throughout 48 states. Because at this time, that's all there were, 48. So there was quite a few along the East Coast. There were quite a few there, too. The camps were good for the local economy. Farm products, fuel, lumber, hardware, and other camp items were bought locally. The CCC was good for the national economy because over the years, the three million men had to be clothed, fed, supplied with tools, machines, materials, trucks, cars, trailers, heavy equipment, furniture, and office supplies. 
12 to 15 million family members benefited from the enrollees' monthly allotment checks. More than $700 million was sent to the families. The entire cost of the Corps was almost $3 billion in nine years. The average camp had 24 buildings, which included a kitchen and mess hall, a recreational building, school building, an infirmary, <coughs> barracks for the enrollees and quarters for the officers and enlisted personnel. Each camp was like a city. It had facilities for food, health, education, religion, entertainment, blacksmithing, plumbing, and automotive repair. Okay, and now we'll see some of the pictures of the camps. By 1936, camps were made of portable, pre-cut buildings which could be moved after work was completed in an area. A permanent camp would sometimes have tent camps erected for particular objects. Of over 4,000 camps built in the U.S., very little evidence is left of them today. This is the procedure of enrollment. Each candidate was interviewed by the local selecting agency to see if he would benefit from the CCC program. After passing a physical examination, he took the oath of enrollment. Then the enrollee was sent to an army base for conditioning before being sent to his assignment camp. Many of the boys enrolling in the early days were underweight and undernourished. They gained an average of 11 and a quarter pounds in their first three to four months in the CCC. Health and safety were of primary importance. Each camp had a medical person available. All enrollees received inoculations against typhoid, fever, and smallpox. Each camp had an infirmary. An illness was treated quickly to prevent the spread of disease and to get the enrollee back to work. Each enrollee had to bathe at least once a week, clean his teeth every day, keep his hair short, keep his fingernails short and clean, and keep his bedding and clothing clean. Um, not, okay. Um, let's see. There's the library. Okay. Firefighting, suicides, and deaths from disease. Control, timber 
timber estimating trees planted. A lot of work here. When the U.S. entered World War II, former CCC men were a vast number of trained manpower for the armed services. The range of job training provided through the CCC was expansive. It helped the endless and jobs after the CCC. So, all these things on the left, the building park structures, bridges, lookout towers, dams, roads and trails, fighting force power, fires, all trained in all of these. Training in plumbing, carpentry, electrical wiring, concrete finishing, handling special tools and machines, surveying and landscaping. You know, you gotta think about a lot of these people might have been in cities or something, never had any contact. Road building, using the bulldozers and heavy equipment, forestry jobs, Biology, maps, compass tools, cooks and bakers, and have our food there for those boys, office skills, canteens, and clerking jobs. Training varied from camp to camp. In January of 1941, the enrollment was 300,000. By the end of 1941, enrollment was, went down to 160,000 and located in only 900 camps. Jobs became more plentiful and fewer men were enrolled in the CCC. Many of the CCC people entered the military service. After June 30th, 1942, the CCC went out of existence, seven months after the U.S. entered World War II. The total number of different camps between 1933 to 1942 was 4,500. Each state had a CCC program during those nine years. Men worked either in their own state or were transferred to an out-of-state camp. And then New York reforestation and the improvement of forest and park areas throughout the state was major accomplishments. Tree disease and insect pest control projects were initiated. More than 220,700 men from the state were enrolled, the greatest number of any of the states. An average of 68 camps a year were operated with a total financial obligation within the state of over 134,500,000. And here are, uh, Ruth is going to report now on her findings. Okay, New York State had 102 CCC camps, which include 39 state forest work camps, 28 state park camps, 13 Corps of Engineer camps, and nine private land camps, eight soil conservation camps, and five military camps. If you spend some time online, you can find out where the camps are located. And uh, we may mention a few later. A total of 220,752 men were employed in those camps, the most of any of the 48 states. Okay, now one person who was famous in this area back uh, in the 40s, 30s and 40s, was Ray Benson. Ray Benson was born in Stillwater, New Jersey. After graduating from high school, his interest in forestry led him to Syracuse University. While a student, he joined the CCC in 1933. He stopped his studies became a member and leader of the 229th Company under Captain Brigham's command for nine months. He first went to the Madison Barracks near Sackett's Harbor, New York, for conditioning, which took 14 days. He then went to Benson Mines, New York, for forestry. This was a college forest in Wanakina, New York. His job took him on many adventures. Ray kept a journal of his work. Read, Ruth will now read about one of Ray's experiences. I had to do my homework because I had to look up a couple botany words to make sure because I didn't know what they were. Okay, Basher Falls. I was offered on June 1st, 1934, a job as foreman in the Brasher Falls Volunteer Civilian Conservation Camp. And Sometimes that B stands for veterans because some of these camps were not for the young boys, they were for veterans of World War I. These men were veterans, World War I, and were more than twice my age. 
However, we did get along fine. The main job at Brasher was again pulling the rides, and I didn't know what rides were, but they're currant or gooseberry bushes. And these plants, they had to pull them because the white pines were getting disease from them. We tramped through sand dunes, swamps, and this was another word I didn't even, I'm not sure even how you pronounce it. It's H-A-C-K-A-M-A-T-A-C-K. -A 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 Anybody got a good idea how you pronounce that? Well, anyways, it means, huh? Okay, good. It's a conifer tree or shrub and they had prickly leaves, so they had to get them, that undergrowth, out. Uh, the mosquitoes were atrocious. Uh, we had to wear leather jackets, leather gloves, high top boots with bridges laced below the knee. The mosquitoes got in everywhere, through the thread holes in our gloves, the eyelets in our bridges lacing. We wore flapping red bandanas on our heads in a coal tar preparation as a mosquito lotion. All this in hot weather of June, July, and August. One day, as we were about to go to supper, the fire gun sounded, and we jumped out, our state body truck with holes and rakes and fire pumps. We soon saw the smoke, and we raced from the road into the woods to put out the fire. As we arrived, we noted the fire was mostly in some brush around a very large pine tree. As I looked up to see if the tree had been struck by lightning, I was surprised to see a kid sitting on a limb reading a book called Rover Boys in Florida. He hadn't said a word while we were putting out the fire, but as soon as I saw him, he said, my pa, will give you guys hell for putting that fire out. I said, your pa will be the one to get hell and go to jail the next time he starts a fire. So we hopped on the truck and raised back the child. The camp set up at Brasher was quite poor. I was assigned to a tent without floorboards. And when it rained, everything got soaked. I put up with that for about two weeks. And then with one of the other foremen, I moved into town. We found a room in a very nice private house. The room was $1.50 each per week. When September arrived, I figured I had saved enough money for another year at college, at the forestry college. So I resigned my job and I returned to Syracuse. And his book, will be available later, and it's very interesting reading, so if you'd like to buy a copy, I'll sell you a copy later. I, yeah. I love it. It was really great reading. So after Ray left the CCC, he returned to the College of Forestry at SU and graduated in 1939. His life continued in central New York. He was the Deputy Commissioner with Onondaga County Parks Department for 25 years. He was the superintendent of Highland Forest in Vegas and the founder of the Pioneer Museum, which opened to the public in 1959. Ray retired in 1972. In 1979, he became the curator and director of the Pompey Historical Museum. I went to the website for the CCC at cccelegacy.org to find any local camps near Vegas. There is one at Crump Hill, six miles southeast of Dryder, Chittenango Falls near Casnovia, Green Lake State Park east of Fayetteville, and Chenango, seven miles from Charleston. And now Ruth and I would like to give you some CCC trivia. Yes, David? Well, okay. <laughs> The Veterans Administration selected all war veteran enrollees. If an enrollee was absent without leave more than eight days, he was given a dishonorable discharge. 
Three days leave was granted in order for an enrollee to vote or register to vote in a primary or general election. Camps were inspected periodically and rated. The best in a district was presented with a flag or banner. If a junior enrollee got married while in the CCC, he could finish his enlistment but could not re-enlist. Hitchhiking or riding freight trains was prohibited. It cost approximately $1,000 per enrollee, enrollee per year in 1940 for food, clothing, and overhead and allotments to dependents. A typical enrollee was between 18 and 19 years old upon enlistment, had completed eight years of school, and had been without a job for seven months prior to entering the Corps. He weighed about 147 pounds, was five foot eight and a quarter tall, and served in the CCC for nine to 12 months. The U.S. Department of Labor supervised the selection of the enrollees, but did not make the actual selection and had no staff for it. The Relief Administration in each state made the actual selection. In 1939, the CCC Administration took over direct selection of the enrollees. In 1933, almost three quarters of the CCC camps were in national or state forests. We can take it was the unofficial model of the CCC used by the enrollees. Through its nine-year history, two camps at Broken Arrow in Keystone, Oklahoma were named We Can Take It. In March 1933, there were an estimated 13,600,000 people unemployed in the United States. Before the CCC was established in 1933, Many European countries, such as Germany, Bulgaria, Switzerland, Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Netherlands, and Great Britain, as well as Canada and South Africa, had established youth works camps. The camp with the highest elevation was in Colorado at 9,200 feet above sea level, while the lowest was in Death Valley, California, at 270 feet below sea level. 25 federal government agencies participated in some capacity in the CCC. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about the Highland Forest. In this 1959 edition of Babies Past and Present, section on Highland Forest does not mention anything about the CCC. The first trees were planted in a dedication ceremony in 1930. The work of building paths, fireplaces, bridges and parking areas was accomplished by many local men temporarily out of regular employment during the Depression years. The park was opened to the public in June of 1932. I hope this program on the Civilian Conservation Corps has provided you with a little information. There's a lot out there if you want to really research more. There is more to be found in local libraries and on the internet. So, is there anybody who wants to say anything? Can I just bug you one minute before we go on? I know some of you probably get confused because there were so many initials during Franklin Roosevelt's administration. And one of them is the PWA. And I think sometimes I get the PWA mixed up with the WPA. The PWA was part of the New Deal in 1933. It was headed by the Secretary of Interior. It was created for the National Industrial Recovery Act in June of 1933 in response to the Great Depression. It built large-scale public works such as dams, bridges, hospitals, and schools. Its goals were to spend $3.3 billion in the first year and $6 billion in all to provide employment stabilize purchasing power and to help relieve the economy. Most of the spending came in two waves, in 1935 through 35, and again in 1938. Originally called the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works, it was renamed the Public Works Administration in 1935, and it shut down in 1943. And the other one, 
which I get messed up, is called the WPA. And it was the Work Progress Administration. They were both part of the New Deal, but the WPA was headed by Harry Hopkins, and he lived at the White House with Roosevelt's and had been big friends with them for years. And he had been in social work, so this was really his baby. And they were more unskilled laborers, and they built more the roads and, and small projects where the Public Works Administration built like the Triborough Bridge, uh, the Lincoln Tunnel, all those bridges going out to Key West in Florida, and uh, the Cooley Dam. So they did the super huge ones. And my dad always told me when I was a kid about the work crew that went by our farm and how sorry he felt for this one man because he he took water out to the workers because they figured they needed something to drink. And he talked to the one man who had been a professional. And here he's working on these road crews. And who knows if he had been to Pratt's Falls that day working or where. But my dad says his hands were completely covered in blisters. So he knew he wasn't used to hard labor. And so he said, I took my gloves off and I gave them to him. And I wished him the best of luck. And that's why I mixed up the WPA and the PWA. <laughs> okay, now I know there were not camps around here, but we did use some CCC workers. Mr. Conway, you want to tell me what? Green lights, though. Hold it near your mouth. <laughs> Is it on now? Yep. My father bought the farm in Coopersville in 1928. Fred DeMong was a Boy Scout leader, and he built a camp in the woods to the west of my house. In doing so, in 1933, the sea sepoys stayed there, and they'd walk up the Highland Park and plant trees. The camp would sleep six guys, and they had a stove there, they had cook on there, so they left in the morning with their lunch, and back at night and that was where they stayed. So I guess that's about it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to contribute something? Yes, okay. Um, years and years ago, uh, my oldest brother got his first job after college uh, for GLF, I think it was called then. And it was over in uh, kind of the western part of the state in so my mother and my sister and I went over to visit him, and it happened to be in the area of Letchworth Park. And I had never known at all, all those years I grew up, that we had a, the Grand Canyon of the East here in New York State. And it was beautiful. I guess a lot of that was done by the CCC. And the one story that stuck with me is because Paul's boss had been in the CCC and worked in that park. And he said that they brought in black snakes to kill the rattlers so that when people visited the park, they wouldn't get bitten by the rattlers. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to have to go to the next slide. I was born in 1932, over four miles from here. I had an uncle, my wife's, or my mother's brother who was in the CCCs, and he used to tell about it, so whatever I'm telling you is second hand. Uh, but they, he was in the CCCs in the mid and early 30s, and when he got out of there, he went into the Army. Now you gotta remember back in the 30s, if a guy had $25, he had a lot of cash. And if a farmer or anybody else had three or four boys in the CCCs, they got a lot of money per month. Most of them people would have $25, $30, maybe $50 a year hard cash in the mid-30s. So that was a good deal for everybody. But anyways, back to my uncle, he was in the CCCs and used to tell us stories about it. But um, he went into the Army, he came along, nothing going on, he went back in the Army and he had four years. He was scheduled to get out in December of 41. Um, 
The war started in December 7th. He was in for the duration. He stayed in the Army um, all duration, stayed stateside, and that's all I know about the CCs, except uh, Jimmy and some of us that worked with Bob Osson, we helped plant a lot of stuff up on Highland Park for trees, and there is a CCs just below Truxton that's part of it still there. But I have nothing to do with those. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? I like these comments. Okay. Sandy, I don't have anything to contribute, but I have a question. Reading and listening to Jerry Anto's story about the camp in Tully, that sounds like it was a huge camp. Is it really possible that there could have been 12,000 there? And does anyone here have any information about what that camp was and did? I don't know, but most of the reading I did in the last couple, three years, none of the camps were really that large. So I'm surprised that there was really 4,000 there. Yeah, let me say a word about Jerry Antill. I think many of you know him, but some of you may not. He's a writer, and I know that he's put some of you into his books, with your permission, of course. Uh, so he is interested in this area and the people here, and so I, I don't know how much research he did on this particular topic. Uh, but I, I think in general, he tends to be a pretty good writer and historian. Is he correct on this? I don't know. Oh, let me say one more thing. There was a day when your father, Dwayne, and I were having a conversation. And Dwayne said to me, he said, you know, in my long life, I think the most difficult thing I ever had to face was the Great Depression. And he was telling me stories about what it was like to be a farmer during the Great Depression and the hardships involved. Thank you, everybody. And I'm glad that you came. And now you give us five minutes. We'll have the refreshments set up. Right here.